So, well, I, I'm, uh, it, we've, we've heard some assessments now of how portions of the clean economy are doing from the Department of Energy uh, and individual private sector uh, actors. Um, it was a promising, but I think decidedly mixed uh, picture, I think of great uh, opportunity, uh, you know, a palpable sense of uh, energy and uh, optimism, but also discussions of a fairly mixed or blurry policy environment at the national level. Uh, but now I, it's time to drill down into U.S. regions, into the metropolitan areas where the clean economy is growing and changing in diverse ways, different in every location. I'm Mark Murrell, Senior Fellow uh, and Policy Director here at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, uh, and, and the lead with Jonathan Rothwell uh, on the Sizing the Clean Economy Project. And what I'd like to do now is lead a kind of another kind of Google Earth expedition uh, down into a few more of the nation's regions, somewhat akin to Bruce's, uh, uh, but this time uh, via people. Uh, so we can assess the growth in, in regions, hear what regional actors are doing to facilitate it, and consider what federal and state policy needs they have. Uh, why do we care so much about regions in our report and seek to you know, insert them into uh, clean economy growth discussions. Well, the reason is really hidden in plain sight. Uh, regions and regional ind industry clusters they contain are absolutely critical focuses because they accelerate innovation. They promote entrepreneurship, enhance job creation. Regions are the places where, given the policy context set by Washington and in state capitals that research is conducted, technologies are developed, ideas are shared, new businesses started, Regions are places where markets are tested, deals done, projects cited, workers trained, workers signed up for new jobs, suppliers located, and all the rest. And in fact, our research, one of, one of the strong takeaways is that clustered, uh, concentrated uh, establishments simply grew faster than more isolated ones at the regional level. So there's now uh, you know, uh, an empirical basis for this you know, claim we've been making. So, in the, and this underscores, we believe, the need to focus much more on what's happening on the ground in diverse, specific regions as we assess the progress of the clean economy in the U.S. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce and stage a conversation here among four you know, truly outstanding, varied, and yet in their own way representative actors in U.S. regional clean economies. We've heard from some firms. Uh, we've heard from an innovative uh, government agency, RPE. It's time to hear from some leaders whose diverse organizations are on the front lines of advancing the growth of the clean economy around the country, but in varied ways. So along those lines, I'd like to introduce our four panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Tom Mason, uh, immediately to my left, your right, is the director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory near Knoxville, Tennessee. And in that capacity, he can speak for the role of major innovation institutions in local economies. Uh, in other cities or regions, it's a major university. Uh, uh, can be other uh, sorts of institutions. But this is Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Knoxville, Tennessee. Rebecca Bagley is president and CEO of Nortec, a regional nonprofit technology-based economic development organization serving 21 counties in Northeast Ohio. Uh, really multiple metropolitan areas networked together. She's leading uh, efforts there to develop a series of advanced technology roadmaps to accelerate growth in, in that region across advanced uh, technology industries. Um, Jim Waring, uh, for his part, is uh, the chairman and board of, uh, of the board and co-founder of Cleantech San Diego, really one of the nation's preeminent clean economy cluster uh, organizations. It's a specifically cluster-focused initiative. And then finally, uh, to the far end, Francis Murray is the president and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, one of the nation's largest and most sophisticated state energy offices. Transforming the New York State economy with a special attention to the economies of regions is the central part of NYSERDA's state mission. So with that, I'm going to ask each uh, of the panelists a few questions, maybe two rounds. Let's try to keep our answers compact so then we have time for a little more uh, dynamic interaction. Then we'll open this out into a more interactive discussion, questions from you in the audience and you in the Twitter sphere. Uh, is that a word? I'm not sure. 
uh, or watching online. And don't you could tweet your questions to our event hashtag, clean econ, or mail them to MetroQ at Brookings EDU. But Tom, I want to uh, start with you and, and ask you to briefly uh, review the ways in which Oak Ridge National Laboratory is not just a national laboratory, but uh, a part of the clean economy innovation system in the Knoxville region. And give us a sense of the value you think you're adding to the local regional economy. And I, I'm interested here because I think labs are sometimes viewed as somewhat aloof uh, institutions. The Department of Energy certainly hasn't had a, a deep history of uh, regional uh, economic development, and yet I think there's a very different story in Knoxville. So uh, perhaps give us a sense of the value add and the participation in your region. Well, Oak Ridge is a science and energy lab. We're a rich resource of you know, a broad range of fundamental science to more engineering application focused work that, that relates to uh, energy. And obviously as a national lab, we interact with companies large and small all over the country. Um, the promises we make to the uh, U.S. taxpayer in order to get our funding are based on some outcome in society and that only becomes real when the private sector takes the products to market. Now what we find is even though we're interacting all across the company, there's an awful lot that just happens locally for very natural reasons. We have no particular preference to our region, no matter how you define that, you call it the southeast, the state of Tennessee, right. or the Knoxville area. Right. Uh, but it really is a human endeavor. There's a huge piece of, of those activities with tech transfer, spin up companies, collaborative research that requires just person to person contact. And that does tend to happen locally. And um, one of the other hats I wear is I'm, I'm chairman of an organization called Innovation Valley Inc., which is a regional economic development activity that, that brings together the multiple jurisdictions surrounding Oak Ridge, uh, the, the, the more urban areas, Knoxville, some of the rural areas in the surrounding counties, Roan County and so forth, uh, to try and draw on the assets that we share as a region. Um, and, and when we put together the strategy for Innovation Valley, one of the things we did was say, what are those assets? We actually had the Battelle Technology Group come in and do an inventory. And not surprisingly, what we found was a lot of them tied to this clean energy, clean economy that we're now talking about. And uh, it wasn't just Oak Ridge National Lab, it's the Tennessee Valley Authority, the University of Tennessee, and those institutions all have associated with them a set of people who are working on these problems, they're engaged in them. And uh, even if it's not necessarily technology that may have been developed in the lab, oftentimes you find it's people who somewhere in their career, whether as a student uh, having an educational experience or, or during some period of employment came through the lab. And, and th those people are the resource for companies that are trying to grow and relocate. And, and that's been part of our strategy in talking about what we do as a region. Great. Great. Um, Beck, let's hear a little about what Nortech is and does and how it aids and abets the emergence of clean economy growth in your region. And, you know, I think, a, uh, you know, a sub-question is, you know, won't these firms emerge and grow themselves? You know, what is, again, the special addition of Nortec to, to the 21 county uh, region? Aids and abets makes it sound like some kind of illegal activity or something. <laughs> but, um, so <laughs> Nortec, as I mentioned, covers 21 counties uh, in Northeast Ohio. And um, that, just to, to place people in that, it's, it's Akron, Cleveland, Youngstown, Lorraine. Those are some of the, the major metropolitan areas within that geography. So it is, you know, metropolitan areas sort of linked together with, um, with a nice rural base in there as well. Um, we do our work through regional innovation clusters. Um, we have a methodology that we've developed that has um, many different facets, uh, whether it's different programs that we're running or things that we um, are, are leading. Uh, the cluster members towards, and, and what I mean by clusters, I mean everybody understands that definition, but basically I break it down into large and small companies, universities, workforce, and funders to drive a, um, a specific industry faster uh, and with more information. And so we're focusing our cluster model right now on two emerging areas uh, in Northeast Ohio, advanced energy and flexible electronics. Um, again, we look at it through the lens of, of really what do we do individually with those companies. So we really have a hands-on approach. We have several different um, uh, programs or, or just a high-touch 
um, efforts that we do to make sure that we're working individually with our cluster members to understand what their needs are, their technologies, give them access to markets and funding that they may have challenges um, to on their own. Then we also look at a regional um, strategy. So this is where we deploy the roadmaps that are um, highlighted in the Brookings report. And basically the road mapping methodology that, that we've developed is a hybrid of other types of roadmaps and it looks at what's the global market opportunity and I think that's really important. It starts with what's the market opportunity. And we did them, I'll use energy storage as an example because we got very specific. So we looked at the 20 systems that can store energy and we went back to the core and enabling parts and, and integration that goes into those systems. We said, okay, what are our assets? What are the companies? What's the, um, what's the research that happens within our region in all of those areas? And then we, built, we brought the cluster members together and we said, based on this information, what are our best opportunities over the next seven years based on the assets that we have today? And we picked five uh, systems in energy storage. And interestingly enough, there was people who represented other sy systems within energy storage in that room, but they decided as a collective that we wanted to drive based on our assets, understanding that you know, our assets could shift and change over time. Um, so we then competitively benchmarked and, and came up with um, what's the seven-year plan look like, how many jobs, and by the way, across all three energy sectors that we focused on in these roadmaps, 50, we expect 5,200 jobs to be created over seven years. Um, and then we also backed up into an action plan. So this is also where we come in and, and sort of, and that defines what we're doing at the company level, sometimes at the regional level, and, and even at the national level. And this action plan helps to define what we're gonna do, what the cluster members feel responsibility for, and that's an 18-month action plan, and we sort of roll that out. So this methodology has really helped to come up with the regional component. How do we drive our strategy based on, and when I say our, it's the region strategy, it's not Nortec strategy. I mean, the industry and research members um, probably spent about 20 hours um, in meetings over the course of the last three to four months, um, you know, individually with these teams developing these roadmaps. So it was an impressive um, effort uh, that they put into it. And then one last um, uh, part is, you know, I talked about the interaction with the companies, the region, and then the national is extremely important. So how do we make sure that our region is thought of as a leader, in this case, in advanced energy, um, that our companies are promoted um, and our research facilities are promoted throughout the country to help bring them resources. And we really look at it like that, you know, to be able to participate in things like Brookings, to be able to, um, you know, meet with national media in New York and to be able to um, bring federal resources back in and affect policy at the federal level. So it sounds like you're creating a kind of uh, collective action uh, focus in a region among a cloud of companies. Yeah. That the uh, uh, Jim, uh, Cleantech San Diego is a membership trade association working with you know, a really diverse, dynamic set of clean tech clusters you know, in Southern California and almost blurring into uh, across the border into Mexico. I mean, when we talked a little bit about uh, the, the dimension of, of lo lower cost manufacturing really, really being accessible to your region. But so what's your role in, as, a, as a particular trade association oriented cluster initiative uh, and quarterback in that region. And by the way, I, you know, we appreciate your support of this work, though I know you feel our numbers may be a little low for, for, to, to describe the full richness of your region. But uh, well, uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, let me speak to your second point first. Very briefly, uh, Cleantech's approximately four years old, and we've really worked very hard to study and drill into our database. Uh, began about three and a half years ago with a study done by Global Connect that looked at what was the clean tech cluster in the community. And then through the work of our board and particularly Glenn Mosier of our board, we've worked very hard to keep that up. So, so when we looked at your numbers, we did notice discrepancies. Uh, and, and, we know, and we believe the numbers are substantially higher. But more significantly and more positively, it, it points to what Bruce was saying. It was a very difficult task in measuring. So what we've been very appreciative of is that Brookings team has said, okay, let's work together. Let's understand your methodology and our methodology so that we come up with accurate numbers. Now that's not important for San Diego necessarily, but what it's important for is we've seen, talked about here this morning, national policy is critical. So the, so the critical mass of this, of this space is critical. 
So if by working together we come up with better definitions and more refined numbers, my instincts tells me we're going to come up with a much larger population of, of clean tech jobs, and therefore that will facilitate the policy. So we look forward to working with you on that in the future. Uh, and then as far as what does Clean Tech San Diego do, uh, again, we're a nonprofit trade organization that was formed in recognition or in a belief that the world is going to change the way we provide, deliver, manufacture goods and services. We, we have to change if we're going to continue to maintain a quality of life. And this is going to have to be done and led by the private sector working on a set of government policies. This can happen anywhere in the world, so why not San Diego? So let's, let's come and compete in San Diego and take advantage of our culture of innovation that, uh, that led to the telecommunication cluster in town, to the bio, biotechnology cluster in town. Let's do the same thing. So we're really a connective tissue, if you will, between the public sector, state and local government, primarily, uh, in, in our great universities, and there are over 70 research institutes in San Diego, and our private sector company. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, one example is, let me introduce one of my colleagues, Jason Anderson, who's here in the audience. Jason's here with some colleagues from around the country and is gonna spend the next two or three days on Capitol Hill talking to representatives and their aides about energy policy matters or policy matters. Another way we're able to do it, again, is a cluster because we have some critical mass. Just within the last month, we had Robert uh, Weisenmiller, who is the new chairman of the California uh, CEC, California Energy Commission, was in town. We were able to have the chairman meet with some Clean Tech San Diego members uh, and talk about what are the issues that they are facing on the ground that have regulatory ramifications at the CEC very firsthand. We were also allowed the chairman to see the microgrid at UCSD, which is one of the great research laboratories in the world. They have a 42 megawatt demand on campus. They're producing 82% of that from renewables. And it's a, but it's a living laboratory. They test things, what works, what doesn't, how do you do man response. And, it's, and, and so, it, so he was able to see that and get a lot of ideas about what's going on and what are the private companies interfacing with that. Then last, last Friday, uh, Mark Farron, who is a new appointment to the California Public Utility Commission, spent an entire day in town. And we had a series of meetings where Mark was able to meet with representatives of our primary clusters, which are electric vehicles, uh, algae biofuels, solar, uh, energy efficiency, and smart grid. So we're able to get people in the business face-to-face -face with significant regulatory persons in order to e e exchange ideas. So that, and, and that's just indicative. But we really think of it as connective tissue because in, the, in reality, you have great research institutes that are complex organizations that work very hard, but they're not necessarily insular, but they're complex in their day-to-day -day work. We have a very involved public utility, San Diego Gas and Electric, big complex organization, but with a very aggressive plan for uh, uh, renewable energy. And then you've got these private sector companies that want to play in that space. But, the, but in and of themselves, they, there's not the systems for communication. We're the system of communication. So you're a convening, convening point, uh, point of efficient uh, interaction. That, that absolutely. And then, and then we pick up from our members, again, the advocacy issues that, that you would expect any trade association to do. To do. So, so we, and, and that just creates a lot of energy, a lot of positive energy uh, in the community, and uh, uh, it's very additive to the community. Excellent. So let's, let's, look, let's turn to a state at a moment where I think you know, state houses and state policy are, you know, very much uh, uh, topmost in, in people's mind given, uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, a lack of uh, progress in, in Washington. Um, I mean, Francis, you lead essentially a state uh, government entity. Uh, can you fill us in on NYSERDA's activities and role in the New York clean economy and particularly how that intersects with regional economies? I mean, too often states too can become a top-down presence uh, in local economic systems, uh, and yet I, I have a sense that uh, NYSERDA is uh, approaching 
its relationship with the diverse regions of New York in a quite different way. Great. Thank you, Mark. And, and it's Frank, by the way. My, my okay. mom gets to I call me Francis, okay. but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are, as Mark alluded to, we are not a, a state agency in the sense of the Department of Energy as a federal agency. Uh -huh. We are a public benefit corporation. We're still a create, creation of the state legislature, but be, by being a public authority under legal uh, statute, we have a great deal more flexibility in how we can respond and react and uh, invest in some of the things that we've been talking about here today. Our breath is pretty strong. I mean, I, uh, pretty broad. I, I run what I, th I think is a wonderful group of talented people whose responsibilities on one extreme run from trying to manage the uh, remnants of the only commercial nuclear fuel reprocessing facility ever to operate in this country in a, in a beautiful area just south of Buffalo. We've been engaged in cleaning up that site for 30 years to at one point in time being the largest issuer of public debt, uh, 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 tax exempt debt in the United States back in the days when the utilities were engaged in investing through bonding authority in pollution control. We were the agency that did that. We still have some responsibilities in that regard and that translates nowadays into some creative financing approaches with regard to energy efficiency and renewable energy technology. All the way over the other extreme, I chair the State Energy Planning Board, which means the analytical work that underlines much of the energy policy analysis in New York State is done by, by my policy folks. But in between is where what we're talking about today and where much of what we're engaged in today is, is, is all about. I have the privilege of having somewhere in the order of a 600 to $650 million a year budget. Much of that money goes into research and development, a traditional route of NYSERDA nice going back to its early days, but also increasingly so in the actual deployment of energy efficiency and renewable energy technology. And as we become engaged in that, you know, the horizon expands. So it's not just paying for the installation of solar panels on residential structures, or that is something we do do. It broadens into the whole opportunities presented by investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Really what we're trying to do is to create an economy that then produces jobs that put people back to work. And that's what every single state in this country is engaged in. And we certainly in New York State view investment in clean tech as an important part of our blueprint going forward. Uh, uh, so that's kind of the broad picture. In terms of your second question about uh, how we operate on a regional basis, uh, one of the best examples is the one that's highlighted in your publication. Uh, we were pleased to see you cite uh, the Albany, the Capital District area, as the leading area in the country for clean tech. We were not surprised. Uh, we've been engaged in this for well over a decade. And the way it works, and what we talk a lot about, very much part of our, our corporate culture, even though we're a governmental entity, is this concept of partnership. We have some fairly progressive policies in New York State to support energy efficiency or renewable energy. And, and I would quibble with Bruce's comment this morning about California having the most aggressive renewable portfolio standard. I would argue that New York does. <laughs> we have a goal of 35% yeah. by the year 2015, I'm sorry, 30%, and on top of which we layer a 15% uh, target with regard to energy efficiency. Our policy objective is to have 45% of our electricity in New York State coming through a combination of investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy technology by the year 2015. So we have a number of governmental policies in place that are designed to support and encourage investment in the clean tech industry. But those governmental policies alone, even with all the resources that I have available, is not going to create what's happened in Albany. What you also need, and again, Albany is an excellent example, is you need to capitalize upon the intellectual capital in our academic uh, sector. Um, the, 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 much of the, the early work in, in the Albany area centered around the State University at Albany and the development of the Nanotech College, which became a springboard for attracting additional investment in the Capital District area and other technologies, and it continues to be. But in New York, it's just not the Nanotech College. We're talking about you know, Ivy League institutions like Cornell and Columbia, but you're talking about you know, engineering institutions like RPI, Clarkson, but you work all the way at Syracuse University in central New York, but you work all the way down to the community college level, which may be the most important part of this whole academic um, um, uh, 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 panorama. 
but, but academia married to you know, private labs like the GE Research Lab you heard about earlier and the General Motors Fuel Cell Lab that we have in Honey Eye Falls, that's where the intellectual capital is. That's where the ideas are coming from. They're not necessarily coming from the folks at NYSERT or my colleagues in state government as bright as we may think we are. But I'll also make the point, the most progressive governmental policies, the most uh, creative um, uh, ideas from academia are not going to produce one new job in New York State unless we do this in a way that we can attract investment by the private sector. And you heard the gentleman this morning from GE. I mean, 10 years ago, who would have believed that GE was going to build a brand new manufacturing facility in upstate New York? part of the Rust Belt, so to speak, but they're building a brand new battery manufacturing facility just down the street in Schenectady. Just north of Albany, the largest single private sector construction project in the country, Global Foundries, building a brand new chip manufacturing facility. That's not governmental funds, that's the private sector. And what we've been able to do in the Albany area is to bring together government, academia, and the private sector to create what you described, I think, so well in your report today. And we're looking to replicate that all across the state. We're looking to replicate it in building technologies in the Syracuse area. We're looking to do it in the Hudson River Valley with respect to solar technology. We've got some interesting things going on down in Long Island with regard to energy storage. So it's, it's kind of a mindset that we've brought to this whole process that government is part of the solution, but we don't have all the answers. And we need to work together successfully in partnership if we're going to be able to create this clean tech economy, which is a wonderful thing to have, but ultimately what we're really talking about is putting people back to work, which is the most important thing I think we can do for our economy as a state or as a nation right now. I find that I find extremely interesting to the uh, sense of variegation it seems like you see, a kind of differentiated approach region to region, uh, all, all in service of some particular strategies. Well, well, it's not that different from what Rebecca was describing in Northeast Ohio. You look to capitalize upon the unique strengths and resources and, and what works in Albany may not work in Syracuse for Ed or down in Long Island. You have to capitalize upon what you have where it is. So, One of the single takeaways from our report is how many stories and different uh, realities there are in the region. What I want to do now is uh, 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 turn this to how each of you think things are going in your region economically very briefly and then uh, 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 ask you for a sense of the, the region focus uh, you know, particular policy or other uh, needs that uh, you think are missing pieces in the region. So, Tom, I mean, you know, obviously the Knoxville region, uh, uh, you know, obviously has had a, a pretty good decade uh, uh, in these in this space uh, with significant growth, according to our research, uh, in part due to Oak Ridge's own growth. But I'm wondering, what are the missing institutional or policy items now? I mean, I think the first panel described a degree of flux uh, and uncertainty, uh, certainly in national policy. Uh, so what, what, is, what, is, what, are you, what are the next, what would further crack the code in your region and sustain growth? Well, certainly uncertainty is a problem. Uh, I think for an area like Knoxville, access to capital it can, can be a problem. Uh, you know, I think there are lots of places in, in, around the country and around the world that say, well, it's not like Silicon Valley. And of course, the reason is there's probably nowhere quite like Silicon Valley. Uh, and that's, that's certainly true in, in our region. There, there isn't that same sort of tradition of risk taking and, and intellectual property can look a little bit intangible uh, to, to people mm -hmm. who may be more used to investing in assets that you can walk on and put your hands on. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the themes that, that you heard a lot in the previous session was the discussion around manufacturing. And, and I think that that is important. I mean, my own belief is that, that we're not going to have a vibrant economy if, if, you know, in some sense what we're doing is, you know, I'll cut your hair and, and you can uh, polish my shoes. We've actually got to, we've got to be making some things as well. And, and there's a whole set of policy levers that, that go into that in terms of how you enable uh, manufacturing and, and um, clean energy is, is as something that ties into the manufacturing center in a, in a very kind of direct way impacted by that. Uh, the, the investments in R&D that were discussed uh, and one of the highlighted recommendations in the report I, I really do think are important. There is a lot of debate particularly at the federal level about what's the appropriate government role. Uh, 
obviously national labs, universities, research institutions. They don't manufacture things. They don't sell things. That's not our role, but I think there is an appropriate federal role at the front end of the innovation spectrum. And uh, in the energy sector in particular, one of the things that I think we have suffered from is that uh, there isn't a lot of stability actually in the research environment. Even though research is a pretty long-term activity, and you might think that because of the long time horizons to go from the lab bench to deliver a product that you would have some stability in the research policy, what you've tended to find is that, that even in the research sector, there are flavors of the day that come and go with new administrations. And you know, if you've got a problem that's going to take 10 years to solve, uh, and you're on a two-year cycle moving in and out of favor, you know, getting 10 years over 30 years of on and off is not the same as a 10-year sustained effort. And that's why I think some of the models that are being talked about now, uh, like the energy innovation hubs, uh, there was one mentioned in, in, um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're involved in one that's focused on, on nuclear energy using high-performance computing to really get very good models, predictive models that will enable power upgrades and, and, and uh, better understanding of safety margins and so on. That's a model that allows for a fairly focused reasonably sustained effort. Uh, the intent is that it's sort of five years with the possibility of, of another five years, depending on, on how things are going. You know, you can, you can make significant progress on a very difficult research problem on that time scale. It's very hard to make progress in a research problem where you, you get partway into it and then, you know, the focus shifts. And, and if, you, if you look at the energy sector, you know, we, we, we do tend to see things you know, hydrogen is great, hydrogen is not great. And that's, that's very difficult when you're on the research end of things uh, to, to make that progress when, when the rug keeps getting pulled out. Very good. Um, I mean, Rebecca, clearly, uh, you know, your region is beginning to see some real traction in you know, manufacturing, production-oriented uh, uh, end of this economy. The strength of smart grid, fuel cells, advanced batteries, wind. It's a pretty interesting uh, kind of evolution of the region's industrial past. Uh, I'm interested here. I mean, you've, sense, you've suggested some of what uh, uh, Nortec does and its value add, you know, where does that leave off, you know, and what is the appropriate division of labor then for federal and state uh, uh, engagement as well? What's been missing too? Yeah, I think that um, several things that, that come to mind when you talk about that. One of the things I didn't talk about in my opening is this connection with these emerging industries into the manufacturing base. And I think, you know, certainly with heavy manufacturing areas that becomes critical. And I think the good news coming out of the recession is that more and more manufacturers are ready to really commit to um, investment around product process and market innovation. And so if we're at the ready um, with these cluster you know, opportunities to be able to show a path to tie that into the manufacturing base, I think it really um, bodes well for, for economic growth. And, and that's one of the you know, we're working with our manufacturing extension partner in the region, Magnet, to be able to um, really have a high touch with those manufacturers. Um, from the perspective of uh, state and federal and, and uh, their role, it, obviously I think it's a, a huge role. Um, I think from a policy perspective and an incentive perspective, um, at the state government, we've been very lucky um, that we have the Ohio Third Frontier. The voters uh, last May just extended that $700 million over five years, a bond issue. 62% of the voters decided to extend that. And by the way, this is a technology commercialization university sort of looking to the future mm -hmm. um, program. And, um, and people felt enough hope in May of last year to, to be able to, to authorize the state to do $700 million in bonds for that. So I think that's huge. Um, our governor's in the midst of, of um, organizing with Battelle, actually, is here, uh, an energy summit uh, in September. And I think that'll be great. It'll bring leaders from around the country um, to start uh, really laying out what they're calling a comprehensive energy strategy for Ohio. And, um, you know, as... I'm hoping that that will evolve in the way that it really is the way to tie energy development in with economic development. And, um, and that's, I think, the, the current um, thought process of, of our governor, which is uh, you know, very helpful. 
And um, then, you know, a lot at the federal level, I mean, I agree with peop everything that people have said, so I'll bring up one other thing that, that I think is a real challenge in regional development, um, which is streamlining of capital into the regions and how we apply as a region, whether, whether we're talking about a, a company or a manufacturing strategy or, you know, an intermediary. I mean, it's just extremely cumbersome and there's no real, you know, in manufacturing, for instance, there's approximately 40 programs in about seven different agencies. Um, so if you want to come up with a comprehensive manufacturing strategy, it's managed by all of these different people, you know, so you have to sort of manage through that, whether, again, it's a company, a university, um, a, a region, like we would want to organize our region around that. So I think if we can figure out a way to, um, at a minimum, sort of have an overarching strategy at the federal government, but hopefully I would go one step further, which is breaking down some of the congressional and administration barriers to actually, you know, pull or make more flexible that money so that regions can, act, so you can do what we've been talking about, which is this bottoms up approach where regions can actually apply for the type of money that they need to further the economy. And then that becomes, um, an issue of, of really sort of this bottom-up growth as opposed to even the structure of the federal programs and incentives in some areas can, um, can sort of dictate how you're growing, so. Mm -hmm. Jim, what, what have been some of your good and even bad encounters with federal and state policy? I mean, it seems like you, you, know, you have significant momentum in San Diego. <laughs> Yet there are certainly, uh, you know, background conditions that are suboptimal. So I'm interested, you know, what has worked uh, with higher levels of government and whatnot. Well, let me let me talk first about, uh, and, and you started this session by saying what's positive and yeah. what's working. Uh, again, in the state of California, we do have a set renewable portfolio <laughs> standard. We have Assembly Bill 32, which sets some greenhouse gas limitations. And we have a, a Assembly Bill 375, which is a smart city. So we have this regulatory framework. Now, it's still being fleshed out, but it's on the books. And that has led to this sense of long-term policy, which leads to long-term investment. <laughs> and, a, and a classic example of that is just recently, Soytech, which is a French company, and they have a, a solar, uh, concentrated solar manufacturing arm, announced they're going to build a factory in San Diego that will employ 500 direct jobs, and that will be open by the end of next year. Now, why did they do that? They did that because they are providing the concentrated solar arrays for a solar farm that's going to be selling the power to SD, San Diego Gas and Electric as part of the renewable portfolio standard. And, and the nature of their factory is such that they're able to build it not only in the U.S., but in California which leads to another theme that's come up here. We give up too easily on manufacturing, and I think a number of, of speakers have said that. One of the solar companies in, in San Diego is called Sullivan Solar Power, and they're a design installer. Now, now they, they compete for every single job. They have 55 employees. They installed 6.5 megawatts of rooftop solar last year, and, and Daniel, who owns the company, will only bid using U.S. manufactured panels. <laughs> period. And he's competing with people that are bringing in the cheap stuff. And I said, well, how do you compete? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm more efficient and I'll work on lower margins. But the, but the point is, it can happen. We just kind of default to things. So, so I, I want to point that out. Another thing that's going on in town that's very positive is by the end of this year, San Diego will have 10% of the Nissan, uh, the Nissan Leafs in America. Now, Putting a few electric vehicles on the grid is no big deal. When you put bunches of electric vehicles on the <laughs> grid, it's a really big deal. Okay. I mean, we, and we've put together a consortium with the utility, with General Electric, with the city, UC San Diego, and, 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 uh, and Cleantech San Diego to study what does it really mean right. to put EVs on the market. Uh, the utility will tell you that if they just have to bolster their grid and infrastructure to accommodate the EVs, that's a $7 billion capex. So what we're trying to study is real-time pricing, software, incentives, what works and what doesn't. And the goal there is to build a prototype. How does a community incorporate large numbers of electric vehicles? What works and what doesn't? Almost like a how-to book. What are the government issues? How do you issue permits, et cetera, et cetera? And then we hope to have that book available 
that we could, for anybody to use. But, it's, but the, the number of companies, software and product companies interested uh, is, is, very, is, is very, very exciting. Uh, and then an, another very positive thing in the community, the U.S. Navy is a real leader in sustainability. Mm. And, and when you talk to Admiral French at Navy Region Southwest, you know, he does it for budget reasons, but he also does it because the Navy knows, the military knows that every gallon of fuel they deliver to some backwater in Afghanistan <laughs> costs seven to $800 a gallon. If they're able to encourage efficiencies to be able to produce that cheaper, then that not only saves lives, but it, but it saves monies. So, uh, Bruce, you mentioned Veridity is in Philadelphia. Well, Veridity is also in San Diego. They're a Cleantech San Diego member and are working very closely with the Navy uh, as an example. So we have a lot, and I mentioned earlier the, the, the microgrid at UCSD, oh. and uh, believe me, there are dozens of companies moving products in and out of there and, and, and real-time testing that they could never do on their own which is also spurning, uh, spurring a lot of innovation. So those are some of the positive things. And again, it's been said here repeatedly about the issue. The issue is regulatory certainty. I mean, see, I, I believe that the private sector will, the demand is so great and the need is so great that the private sector will respond. The role of government is to set the baseline and then just get out of the way. It's a shame that Frank has to correct who has the highest renewable portfolio standards in America. We shouldn't have that conversation. We should have a standard, yeah. and the country's so big, the energy is so great, that again, I, I just believe we can, we can reach it, and it's, if we could overcome what I think the lack of, of confid confidence yeah. that seems to be politically professed in Washington and the lack of vision that seems to be politically professed in Washington, that, uh, that we can compete uh, successfully with anybody. That, that's excellent conversation. Um, Frank, you know, uh, I think NYSERDA uh, raises the question of how sufficient state policy can be. You know, I think it is a, a moment where it would be nice if, you know, state policy were sufficient. So I'm interested in, you know, to what extent does state policy uh, suffice? And you're doing a wide range of things at some scale, uh, certainly having some de demonstrable impact. Uh, you know, to what extent can we get along with you know, strong uh, uh, activity in our laboratories of democracy? Well, I think state policies, as evidence, what's by not only what's happening in New York, but in California, Ohio, and Tennessee, has a lot to do with success investment. But by itself, it's not going to get us where we want. I mean, we listened to the panel earlier today. The states don't control import-export policy. Uh, <laughs> states don't set national standards. Uh, though I would make the caution that some national standards would just soon not see. I don't want to see the federal <laughs> government come in and impose, for example, a renewable portfolio standard in California or New York that essentially undermines and undoes what we already have in place, what the federal government should be doing is looking to places like Ohio, California, Tennessee, and New York that are leaders and adopting some of those policies rather than settling for what often is the case, which is the lowest common denominator. We need to push, we need to push the envelope, so to speak. But I think states do have an awful lot to, uh, to contribute in terms of promoting and, and realizing the benefits of the clean tech economy. Um, there are problems out there, and some of which we cannot solve by ourselves, and there the federal government could be helpful. We heard it, um, Brian, I think, was particularly effective in the first panel, talking about the, the challenge of finding capital for some of these um, startup companies. The, the reality, that's hard for the states to do, particularly in this fiscal environment. I mean, we're able to do it a little bit at NYSERDA. Our colleagues in economic development, quite frankly, in New York, don't have those resources. We do have a state pension fund. I think you're doing it in California as well, where the Comp Controller has set aside some funds to help promote the, the development and location of these green tech companies in New York State. But we clearly could use policies in the federal government that support investment in these sort of uh, clean tech economies. The second thing I think we could use from the federal government is more support for innovation. Again, we heard that in the first panel. And I think what Arun is doing is wonderful. But Arun needs 10 to 20 times more money than is being budgeted. Uh, 
And we sit here, and I mean, well, we don't sit here. Fortunately, I'm no longer in Washington. But in the outskirts, I mean, out, out in the hinterland, we listen to what's going on here in Washington, and we just kind of shake our heads. <laughs> Unless we invest in innovation, there is no future. You heard that in the first panel today. And why the federal government should be debating whether or not we should be investing in innovation just totally astounds me. And I guess the final point I would make, and, and I think part of the reason that some of the states we're talking about here have been successful, is there has been the consistency that we talked about, about governmental policy supporting investment in these sort of industries. And I can speak for New York, and I suspect it's true. I know it's true in California. I suspect it may be true in Ohio and Tennessee. That support is not partisan. It's been there in New York through Republican and Democratic administrations. You don't see in the successful states the same sort of partisan bickering right. that you see going on here in Washington. That regardless of how one feels about the particular issues, some may be right, some may be wrong, we need to find a way to come together, I think, as the states have already successfully, at least the successful states have demonstrated, creating jobs is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It's an issue that we should all come together and adopt policies that make that happen. Thanks, Frank. So, uh, you know, this has been fascinating, but I do want to open this out now to you in the audience uh, and online. And if you'd like to ask a question about the regional dimension of the clean economy, that, let me ask you just state your name and affiliation or region, uh, because that matters, before asking your question. Uh, so I believe there are some mics ready. And alternatively, if you're watching this on, on the webcast, uh, again, feel free, to, feel free to tweet your question to clean econ or hashtag tag or to email to metroq at brookings.edu. So let's take a few. OK, we'll go, go, go outside first. Sure. We have a, another question from Twitter. We've actually had a number of great questions from Twitter. Here's one from Joe Arellano from the Center for the Next Generation. With increasing budget cuts to states and metro areas, will regions still be able to continue leading the way in clean economy and innovation? Maybe let's go to Jim. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and I feel strongly about that. And, and the reason is, I'll just, I, it's obvious from the panel, reflects what we're seeing in San Diego. There's so much energy and enthusiasm about this. And remember, it's, there, there's so much diversity. The technologies we're talking about are literally dozens of technologies. Uh, and, and that energy isn't going to go away. Uh, it, it maybe will get tougher with bad policies. It maybe will get longer with, with short money. But uh, the energy and the push to innovate, which has driven certainly our region and other parts of this country for decades, that's, that's as alive and well and, and vibrant as ever. And so, no, I'm optimistic that'll continue. Great. I would say, too, you know, the commitment from the business community um, in, in San Diego, it's evident. And then, um, you know, in Northeast Ohio, I mean, they're funding these organizations that are, you know, helping to drive things, the foundation community. So there's other, so you have to be a little more creative sometimes when right. the state and federal um, budgets are not, you know, as optimal. But I think, you know, that a lot of what we've heard today is the clean economy is about being creative. I mean, it's, it's a whole new world for financing tools, you know, over the course of time. Um, it's a whole new world for, I think, the intersection of economic development and, and the clean energy, you know, economy, which before was all regulatory, you know, mostly regulatory and policy based, and sort of the collision of those things and, you know, understanding utility markets, understanding your PUC. I mean, those things are not you know, IT, um, you know, driven, sort of those same things don't, don't uh, in, in lots of markets, so. I think right. the, the my momentum of uh, the technologies themselves and the private sector and, and native demand yeah. remains, uh, regardless, outside of policy. Jim, I mean, one, okay. one of the lessons we learned in New York, by the way, this, it, the, Jim's right, the short answer is yes, but one of the lessons we learned in New York is because of the difficult fiscal situations a lot of states are in, you need to find a way of being creative and isolating the revenues that support these activities right. from the general treasury. And one of the reasons why we've been able to sustain our investment in the type of technologies I've talked about is because my colleagues over at the State Public Service Commission were willing to take the heat and impose a small surcharge in electric and gas bills and then dedicate that money to my authority right. along with the proceeds we get from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a, a carbon 
uh, a mission-based program here in the Northeast. And those revenues have given us predictability. And then we get back to what we heard in the first panel, that private sector needs predictability and certainty in order to be willing to make investments. That's great. I think the other thing to remember is there is a huge predictable driver behind all of this, which is global energy demand. You know, over the next right. 30 years or so, we're going to see an increase in global energy demand of something like 50, 60 percent. We're going to have to find 15 terawatts. And yeah, commodities are volatile. Government policies are volatile. Sure. But rising That's populations right. and standards of living are inexorable. Yeah. Hmm. That's an inherent pull globally. Let's take a few in, in, in the room. Let's see. How about back here? Thank you. Robert Holm from Jobs for the Future. Uh, in Ohio and I heard New York both mention the workforce being a part of your regional strategies or the community college, as you even said, in New York being yes. maybe the most important. Um, the, the whole, most of the dialogue today has especially been focused on the research and sort of engineering and scientist level, but uh, what, to what extent has the creation of opportunities for under baccalaureate degree workforce um, been a part of your strategies and what's the challenges in having that be an integrated mm -hmm. piece of your strategies? If I could respond to that first, uh, a, a, here's a perfect example. We received a grant with some other uh, NGOs in San Diego called EDGE, it's an education grant. And what was the education grant about? We very active algae to biofuel industry. The question is what are the jobs of the future? Right. So by working with the universities and with our community college districts and with private industry, we actually created a curricula to train the both high school and community college persons for these bioenergy jobs. And that curricula has actually the first class just graduated. So it was, a, again, a state incentivized program that we ran recognizing that what are the jobs of the future and how do you train people for them? It was a very good program. We're, I mean, we're settling on basically the same model for how we, um, you know, make sure that the, because I think you run into particular challenges with emerging industries is, um, you know, what are the jobs going to be? Getting some of the, the earlier stage and medium-sized companies to think about what the jobs are going to be, you know, three years from now or, you know, seven years from now, depending on the, the training cycles. And, and the workforce system is that, as it's set up is not necessarily set to do those jobs of the future you know, sort of link. And the community colleges are that natural alignment when you're thinking about proactive strategies like that. So, so we've solved it in, in much the same, I mean, slight differences, but much the same way. Yeah, we, yeah, that's good, that's same. A, a very good question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, President Obama has come to Albany twice in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And interesting enough, the first time he came, he went to the local community college. Just to make the point that you're talking about, that we need to invest in creating and affect the workforce of the future, we fund, through NYSER, to 40 training sites all across the state, primarily through the community college networks. Again, in the Albany area, one of the hallmarks of, I think, of our success is the local community college there has actually built a campus that does nothing but educate young people on how to deal with fuel cells, energy efficiency, PVs, and you'll see these stories, I think, repeated elsewhere around the country. Uh, but it's an essential part of making this whole thing work. One wrinkle of, of the new Brookings Patel research, uh, you know, touches on this. I mean, first, it, it notices the the very balanced occupational profile of the clean economy as defined uh, in our work, and notices that there are many opportunities uh, for less educated uh, workers. At the same time, uh, you know, Jonathan and I make the, the strong point that, you know, we need to have market, uh, a market understanding of the clusters and real industries in places to tune our training. And I think it's been difficult right. to uh, shape our uh, workforce systems uh, work when we don't really know in, in most places uh, a lot about the profile of the right. clean economy. Let's take uh, one more uh, in here. Any, any other? How about, uh, uh, let's see, back here. Yep. Thank you. I'm Rick Ryback with Just Economics. And I have a two-part question. I was sort of wondering um, uh, 
Would a 10 to 20% sales tax on construction labor and materials have an adverse impact on the creation of new factories, new manufacturing facilities, as well as on weatherization and solarization activities? And assuming that the answer to part one is yes, should we focus on the state and local property tax, which while it's only one or 2% of value, unlike a sales tax, which is paid once, we pay the property tax on buildings each and every year that an improvement adds value to the property. So using a net present value calculation, this typical state and local property tax has the economic impact of a 10 to 20% sales tax. And I'm wondering if this isn't having an adverse impact on efforts to make weatherization, new factories and plants and equipment affordable, both on the demand and the supply side. Hmm. I think the challenge with, with weatherization is, is that uh, you know, there are lots of very good technologies that are available now or very near to being available that, that have a pretty short payback time. So they actually make a lot of economic sense to implement. And, and so the, the problem is, is, is one of the, the financing model. And, and uh, you know, there's maybe a little bit of a problem in the competition between, you know, a new kitchen countertop and, and, and a new, uh, you know, high efficiency furnace. There's aesthetic things that come into play as well. But the principal problem is, is that, it, you know, if you don't have that upfront capital, the fact that you you, uh, you know, life cycle, make money on the deal is, yeah. is actually meaningless. So I think if you look <laughs> around the country, there are some places that have been experimenting at ways to, uh, you know, um, recover uh, over time through uh, utility bills and right. things like that, the capital investments that are needed to make those improvements. And if you could do that in a systematic way, I think it could have a, a, a huge effect on the market for those kind of weatherization and energy efficiency products for, uh, for, for, for homes. I think for, for businesses, it's a little bit easier because people can do a cold-hearted yeah. return on investment calculation. But for homeowners who may be struggling to pay bills, you, you do need some other sort of mechanism. And the ability to scale up yeah. large numbers of these transactions. Let's, uh, I think, you know, we do need to move to our final dialogue now. So first, uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, urge everyone to stay seated uh, as we bring Governor Ritter up and uh, uh, prepare for that dialogue. But first, uh, just join me in thanking, uh, I think, these very smart and assertive uh, leaders. So thank you all.